He's never one to ask small questions. A quarter century ago, he famously asked whether Western liberal democracy represented, quote, the end of history. Francis Fukuyama's new line of inquiry takes up another tough question for democracy. Can it survive identity politics? He asks that in his new book called Identity, The Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment. It's a fascinating read, and we're pleased to welcome back to our program in Stanford, California, Francis Fukuyama, Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. Professor Fukuyama, we're always grateful you make time for us here on TVO. How are you doing on the left coast tonight? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me, Steve. Not at all. Let's actually, I want to I start at the end, if you like. I want to start with the end of your subtitle, which talks about the politics of resentment. How much in American politics today is frankly all about the politics of resentment in your view? Well, unfortunately, I think it's all about resentment. I mean, you look at the Kavanaugh hearings that uh, went on, uh, it's all anger on the part of either the opponents or the proponents of that particular judicial nomination who felt that, uh, you know, norms were being violated uh, in the case of you know, the, the, the opponents of Kavanaugh, it represented the, uh, the, the feeling of women that they were not being adequately recognized because of the downplaying of sexual assault. Uh, so all of these things are swirling right now in American politics, and it's contributing, you know, mightily to the, the fundamental uh, polarization that's, I think, paralyzed uh, uh, American government. And in what way is this politics of resentment an outgrowth, an, an outgrowth rather, of identity politics? Well, so you first have to understand what identity politics is. I have a broad definition of it. Uh, we all feel that we've got this inner source of dignity that oftentimes is not recognized adequately by the surrounding society. So that's what's behind the Me Too movement, uh, women feeling that you know, their real selves are not being taken seriously by men. But this takes many different forms. So it can take the form of nationalism when a, a particular region, you know, feels that it's a separate, uh, it has a separate identity from the country that it's uh, uh, embedded in. I think you've got a case of that, you know, in, in Canada. Uh, it could take the form of religion, where I think a lot of Islamists feel that their religion is being slighted. The whole problem in the Middle East, it's, it's all about identity politics, where people are stuck in these categories like ethnicity, religion, sect, uh, region, tribe that uh, determine how they're going to act. And I think, unfortunately, what's happened in the United States is that we are evolving towards that kind of uh, tribalism in which we believe that the way we're born determines, you know, whether we're red or blue, how we're going to vote in elections. And now it's gotten to the point where it's affecting the way we interpret basic facts. So that was one of the fascinating things in those hearings that, you know, the same events, the account of the same events produce completely different op uh, interpretations depending on which tribe you are a member of. So that's the sense in which I think identity has really uh, begun to, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's like a disease that's begun to infect democratic politics, not just in the United States, but in many other developed countries as well. And if we go back into history, how far back do we have to go to find the origins of this politics of resentment? Well, it's always existed. You know, people have always felt that they have an inner worth uh, and they always have sought a, a recognition of it. But I think the modern form is a little bit different because we value that inner self much more than we value the surrounding society. So, you know, a couple hundred years ago, if a woman felt unrecognized, she would have been told, well, just, you know, stay in your place, uh, you know, we're not going to change, you have to adapt to our rules. Whereas today, uh, the feeling is that the whole of society needs to change, and in fact, that's what's going on right now. It's a, it's a wholesale cultural shift on the attitudes, in the attitudes of men uh, and how they treat women, uh, especially now that women have moved into the workplace. And so that, that's something that's, that's quite new. What's also very new in American politics is this right-wing adoption of this identity framing. So many of the people who voted for Donald Trump uh, voted uh, on the basis of these kinds of resentments that, you know, uh, white voters, for example, are increasingly feeling that they are a kind of underrepresented, unrecognized uh, group uh, in American society. And that's a very toxic, I think, development. Well, let me pick up on that because uh, Barack Obama did say earlier this summer 
quote, sometimes I wonder whether I was 10 or 20 years too early, meaning that, uh, you know, big chunks of white America were not ready for an African-American president yet. Do you think he might be right about that? Well, I'm afraid uh, there's a lot of truth to that. I think that people were prematurely celebrating uh, the <clears throat> emergence of a post-racial uh, America in 2008 when he was first elected. But I think what happened was that actually his election stimulated all of these feelings of uh, displacement on the part of you know, the former white mainstream uh, in America. And it's now coming out in very crude ways. And unfortunately, it's being egged on by a president that seems to, you know, share a lot of those racial uh, resentments. And so that's, you know, that's a really toxic mixture. Presidents are actually supposed to try to unite people uh, around, you know, a set of common values. And unfortunately, we've got a leader that's doing exactly the opposite. More on him later. You, you do ask uh, a lot of big questions in your book, and I want to ask uh, one of them right now, even though this is a fairly vast question. You've written that the struggle of modern liberalism was to get away from biological characteristics. That is apparently not what is happening right now. Why not? Well, so identity politics in the modern era really starts in the 1960s with all the big social movements that begin to rock the Western world. So on behalf of racial minorities, women, the LGBT community, the disabled. So all of these groups were marginalized. Uh, they were treated as groups. The, the prejudice, you know, occurred because they were members of these biological uh, fixed categories. And so they responded saying, we want to push back in the ways that are specific to our group. But over time, I think these categories began to harden. Uh, you know, it, it created these, uh, the, the assumption that simple membership in your group would determine what you thought about politics, about culture and the like. Uh, and it's now shifted over from the left to the right where that kind of thinking has, you know, now dominated the way that, you know, the former mainstream uh, thinks about itself. Uh, so that's the sense in which we, you know, have a new kind of politics of identity that's replaced the old ideological spectrum of the 20th century. And it's replaced it in a way that, you know, if, if you're, if you're, thinking is, is determined by the way you're born, by your skin color, by your gender, by, you know, your sexual orientation. That makes politics much more rigid and non-negotiable. This is also pretty clearly not just an American issue. We look around the world right now. We see Vladimir Putin. We see Erdogan in Turkey. We see the Brexit vote, which went that way. Uh, Donald Trump, of course. Orban, Kaczynski in Eastern Europe. Is there a thread that combines all of these elements? Well, I think so. You, you're seeing uh, the emergence simultaneously of populist movements uh, all over the world. I think that they are triggered uh, ultimately by economic causes. So we've had this 40-year period of expanding globalization where there's been a lot of movement of capital, of goods and services, and of people uh, across international borders. And that's caused a lot of disruption. It's hurt the interests of, you know, the working class in many uh, developed countries whose jobs have been shipped to China or Bangladesh or uh, other developing uh, countries, and it's led to a loss of status. It's also led to huge flows of people so that the number of foreign-born in many uh, rich countries has increased very dramatically, and that kind of cultural change coupled with the perceived economic uh, losses, I think, is what's triggered a lot of the resentment that you're now seeing in these backlash votes for, for populist parties. It's probably too facile to say that this is just a failure of liberals in liberal democracy to, um, well, as we would say in Canada, put the puck in the net, you know, to, to, to provide deliverables to, uh, <laughs> to people uh, in all of these different countries. Um, because the Republican Party isn't the Republican Party that I grew up with or that you grew up with either anymore. So is this just a vast rejection um, of all kind of establishment elites uh, in Western countries that we're seeing right now? Is that how you read it? Well, I wouldn't overestimate the strength of this movement because, first of all, Hillary Clinton in the last election in 2016 won, you know, the popular vote by almost three million uh, votes. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the core support for Donald Trump, you know, it's never been more than about 40 percent of the whole population. And similarly, I think in Europe, a lot of the populist parties still remain, you know, minorities. They're very angry and they're very noisy and, 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 and active, but they, they do not re represent the dominant uh, view in those countries. So I, I wouldn't 
you know, say that this is an inevitable wave that's going to overwhelm, uh, you know, liberal democracy across the uh, across the world. No, I hear what you're saying, but but having said that, this this group of people clearly has no time for the Democratic Party anymore. Hillary Clinton got three million more votes, but most of them were sort of clustered on the coasts among uh, more educated, more elitist type people, if I can put it that way. And then the Republicans, you know, mm -hmm. under George W. Bush, gave us the Iraq War. Uh, the, uh, once again, Bush was in power when uh, the great no, that's right. The Great Recession came in. And, uh, you know, Main Street looks and sees nobody went to jail because of the Great Recession. Main Street looks and sees that um, uh, there, there is still, you know, the Iraq War was a disaster with no apparent consequences paid except yep. by those families who sent soldiers over. So how much of the disillusionment is rooted in those events in particular? Oh, no. So there's no question that, you know, in a way, populism is a good thing because people can express their unhappiness with elite policies. And you're right that elite policies failed in, in precisely those ways. In Europe, you had the euro crisis, another elite policy that went bad. You had the migrant crisis in 2015 after the Syrian civil war. So there were a lot of screw ups. And I think that, you know, there's, there's good reason that people should be uh, angry about them. Uh, I think that that's now led to a transformation on the right where it's no longer, you know, dominated by the business elites of you know, Wall Street Journal, the old Wall Street Journal that was in favor of free trade and open immigration. It's now become much more nationalist and closed. And so uh, that transformation has definitely taken place. Mm. Let's talk for a moment about political correctness, because, you know, you can say a lot of things about Donald Trump, but one thing I never hear anybody say is, geez, I wonder what he thinks <laughs> about this. Yeah. Um, we, we like to deal with empirically provable facts on this program, and I suspect it is an empirically provable fact that Donald Trump, not his policies, but as a person, um, you know, is a pretty disgraceful person from time to time. But having said that, how much of his popularity is rooted in the fact that he's just going to tell it like it is, whether you like it or not? Well, that's, you know, he was a brilliant in, in his use of Twitter because previous presidents had Twitter feeds, but they're all done by staffers. They're very carefully vetted, you know, for content to make sure they didn't offend particular groups. And Trump doesn't care. So I think everybody has this feeling that what he, what he says on Twitter is the real Donald Trump. And I think a lot of people appreciate that because there is this real hostility that people have to the kind of political correctness that has emerged around the, you know, the progressive version of identity politics, where you have to be so careful about what you say about, you know, virtually every group, a lot of whom you didn't even know existed, uh, you know, a few months ago. Uh, and so that's another sense in which I think the identity politics on the left has promoted a similar kind of politics of authenticity on the right, uh, where people will say, well, I may not agree with what Trump said, but at least he's, you know, he's not afraid to go against a prevailing opinion. And, and we have to respect that view, don't we? If people feel that they like Trump because they're tired of politicians being mealy-mouthed and lying to them over the years, um, we, have to, we have to create some space for that view, do we not? Well, you know, it's a, it's a delicate line to walk because there's actually a reason for political correctness, you know? I think a lot of people harbor racial feelings that really are pretty nasty. Uh, and it's probably a good thing that they keep quiet about it. And one of the things that's happened, and also I think the, the internet and social media has also facilitated this uh, because of the anonymity that it provides. People are just not constrained the way they used to be. And, you know, it's, it's led to a kind of rapid shift from excessive political correctness to this open-ended, you know, say whatever you, uh, say whatever you feel. Mm -hmm. And that you know, has led to a real breakdown in civility. Uh, and again, I think you saw that in the Kavanaugh hearings, you know, the degree of anger expressed and the kind of outright, you know, hatred on, on both sides. So I think we got to put that genie back in the bottle. I think we can appreciate excessive political correctness for, for what it is, but I do think there's a reason that we ought to be a little bit constrained. Understood. Let's, uh, at the risk of oversimplifying this, uh, I think when I was growing up, it was mostly about left versus right, the two big cleavages in society. And nowadays, it seems to be far more about uh, gender and race. Would you recommend that we go back to the way it was? I would love for the <laughs> politics of Western democracies to go back to the old 20th century cleavages where you're arguing over 
you know, economic policy, whether you should have more redistribution or more, you know, freedom, more pro-capitalist, you know, pro-market uh, policies or, or the opposite. The trouble with identity is that it, it you know, the way you're born determines uh, uh, how you think about things. And once you get into that kind of politics, it breeds intolerance, it breeds an inability to uh, uh, deliberate about uh, complex policy issues because you're debating over these fixed categories. Uh, I think that if you want to see identity politics in action, just go to the Middle East, where you've got several states, you know, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Iraq, all of whom have basically suffered state collapse because they're all about identity politics. You know, the, the sect, the region, the tribe, uh, that you're born into determines how you're going to approach politics and they can't agree on you know the existence of an overarching political community that they belong to which is why you've had state failure there so you know we're not close to that point yet but that's really I think a warning sign of what lies down the road uh, if you continue to insist on these identity categories so I see in you a yearning for the next great American leader to be somebody who can get us out of our tribes is that right well, I think that what we need is to, you know, you can't get away from identity because that's the way we, we think about ourselves. But you can have narrow, narrower ones or you can have broader ones. And I think we need to have an integrative identity that gives Americans something to believe in in common. And it's true for Canada and for every other democracy. If you don't have a sense of national identity, you basically don't have a democratic community because people have to have a common set of values and beliefs in what's legitimate in terms of politics uh, if they're actually going to coexist. And so I think that's something that is created by leaders. That's what leaders do. Unfortunately, a lot of our recent leaders have been dividers. Uh, I think our president is the divider in chief uh, who loves to pick on these racial and other, you know, uh, issues on which Americans disagree very uh, strongly. Uh, and that doesn't have to be. So I do think that this is a situation that could be turned around by, you know, by the right kind of um, uh, political leader. You do have a number of provocative statements in your book, and I want to pluck one of them out right now, read it to you, and then follow up with a question. Here's you in your book, Identity. Being a citizen of a liberal democracy does not mean that people will actually be treated with equal respect either by their government or by other citizens. And I guess the follow-up question is, why not? Shouldn't, shouldn't that be part of the deal in a liberal democracy? Well, it should be. That's an aspiration. But the thing is that, you know, people live in a society where they've got prejudices, where, you know, different groups of people behave differently. They have you know, different cultural habits and the like. And so I don't think that it's really plausible that everybody in those societies actually follows this injunction to treat everyone with, you know, completely equal respect. Furthermore, uh, we actually deserve different degrees of respect. You know, uh, a murderer or a rapist doesn't deserve the kind of respect that a law-abiding citizen deserves. Uh, and so I think that it's just inevitable that you're going to get these assaults on dignity where people feel that, they're not being sufficiently appreciated. Uh, and that can be embedded in government policies as well because, you know, governments have increasingly started to treat people as members of groups rather than simply as individuals. But, uh, okay, I'm going to do follow-up on that because uh, let, let's stipulate that all things being equal, so not criminals, not rapists, not muggers, and so on. All things being equal, do you not think that governments should aspire to treat all of their citizens equally? Oh, of course. No, that, that's, that's part of what it means to be a liberal democracy and to have a rule of law. Nobody is above the law. Everybody is treated uh, impersonally by uh, our institutions. So that's a fundamental of a, of a modern uh, government. All I'm saying is that, you know, governments simply fail to do that. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. like, you look at America. I mean, the, our education system, in theory, is supposed to give everybody an equal education, but the way it's funded... Uh, the way it's organized means that if you live in an inner city, uh, you get a much worse education than if you live in an affluent suburb. Uh, so, you know, there's many ways in which modern governments fail to achieve that equality of respect that, that in theory, is due all of, all of its uh, citizens. Well, this next question may be a case of uh, six of one, half dozen of another, but let me ask it anyway. What do you think is a more accurate description of the problem of liberalism and equality nowadays? Is it over-promising or is it under-delivering? 
Well, it's, um, I would say that it's under delivering uh, in a couple of senses. So one is that, in fact, you have had these big elite policy mistakes that have really disappointed people. Uh, it's under delivered in terms of economic uh, equality. So we have permitted in many advanced countries uh, these vast uh, gaps to open up between, you know, the 1% and the 99%. Uh, every country has a layer of uh, oligarchs that really have undue influence in politics and in society. Uh, and these are all things that could have been prevented by different sorts of policies. Uh, so I think that really the it's, it's the performance of, of governments that is more the issue than, than over-promising. The ideals are fine, and I think we should stick with them. Let's consider another way of looking at these cleavages, and that is, I guess Donald Trump has, has certainly brought to the fore the notion that uh, there are some people who see themselves as Americans, as nationalists first and only, and then there are other people who are more global in their orientation. Uh, I guess some people who believe in the European Union, some people who are part of the, the Remain side in the United Kingdom. Um, I guess, you know, those of us who are from somewhere as opposed to those of us who are from anywhere. How, how useful is that right. as a way of looking at this thing? No, it's very useful. That was a distinction made by David Goodhart uh, uh, in, in a recent book where some people just have a more cosmopolitan outlook. Uh, they depend, they travel, they depend on foreign products and friends and so forth, and others are much more rooted in a single place, and that actually corresponds to a big class distinction. So the people in the anywhere category usually have a college education or higher. Uh, those that are rooted in one place, you know, tend to be uh, less educated. And that's a huge uh, uh, division in society. Uh, and both, you know, there, there, there are problems in, in both of those perspectives because I think the anywheres, the cosmopolitan anywheres tend to look down on the, the people that are rooted. Uh, they don't really appreciate uh, their perspectives and their problems. And it generates this incredible resentment, uh, which you saw then expressed in the Brexit vote and the vote for Trump uh, and the like. Here's another theme you raise in the book, and I'd like you to just amplify on this a bit uh, as well. You've suggested that universal dignity afforded through human rights is not sufficiently satisfying for many. Uh, why do you think? Well, so that's what a democracy does in theory, right? It says you're a citizen and therefore we grant you rights of speech, association, freedom of religion, you can vote, uh, and so forth. And I think if you live in an authoritarian country, those are really valuable. Right? So if you were living in Burma or Tunisia or Ukraine or, you know, a country that had, uh, that really didn't allow people to participate, uh, that's something very precious. But, you know, once you get it, uh, you start thinking to yourself, okay, well, of course I'm treated this way, but I want something more. You know, I, I'm a member of a group that's not being respected uh, because of my gender, because of my, you know, ethnic background. Uh, because of the region in which I live, and so you begin to demand other more particular forms of, of recognition. For example, in Eastern Europe, the generation that lived under communism, I think, you know, felt in, intensely that they wanted these universal equal rights uh, that a democracy provides, but virtually, you know, great majority of the people living in those countries now, Poland, Hungary, and so forth, were born after the collapse of communism. They have no uh, personal experience of that kind of dictatorship, and they can think to themselves, well, the real problem, you know, that's oppressing me is the European Union, it's Brussels. Uh, and they don't really have a point of comparison like their parents did uh, that would, you know, allow them to appreciate that universal form of uh, citizenship rather than these particular forms of, of recognition that they're seeking. In which case, if this is the muck we now find ourselves in, let's go to what we can do to get ourselves out of this muck. And you have put forward some ideas in the book. Uh, for example, immigration reform, civics education, and national service. If, if those three things, which have been, well, immigration reform in particular, absolutely intractable in the United States uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, but, but if somehow you're able to wave a magic wand and make these three things happen, what would be the value of doing it? Well, all of them, I think, uh, solve different kinds of problems. Immigration reform, you know, opposition to immigration is actually 
what's driving people to vote for these populist parties, both in the United States and in Europe. I think actually, frankly, if we had something more like a Canadian uh, skill-based immigration policy and better enforcement, it would take the wind out of the sails of a lot of the anti-immigration groups uh, uh, in the US. Uh, national service, I think, is important because in a democracy, uh, people don't just have rights. It's not just a matter of the government giving you stuff. I think people have to be made aware that they have to be active participants in a, in a democratic uh, community. And then I think the idea of national identity, you know, the, the civics is, is, a, is just a means to the end of creating a, a sense of national identity, which has to be a creedal open one. It has to be uh, one that it can accommodate a de facto multicultural society, but yet give people something in common to believe in, which I think has to do with democratic political institutions, belief in fundamental equality. So I think if you combine all of those and you have the right kind of leadership to push them, I think it would push back against this, you know, this fractionalizing uh, identity politics on both the right and the left that we've uh, experienced in, in recent years. And just one point of clarification, when you talk about uh, national service, is that national military service? Well, it could be, but I think that uh, since we don't hopefully want to fight a lot of wars in the future, it could be civilian service. It could be teaching in the school system. It could be, you know, contributing to public goods in, you know, every town and village and city in the United States. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways you can approach this. Okay, it's a bit cheeky to ask one author to comment on another author's work, but I'm going to do that anyway here because the former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper has just come out with a book and I want to read a quote from him to you and get your take on what he has to say. Here's former Prime Minister Harper in his book right here, right now. If policy does not seem to be working out for the public in a democracy, you are supposed to fix the policy, not denounce the public. But if you listen to some leaders and much of the media, you would not know it. Their response is wrong, frustrating, and dangerous. Wrong because most of today's political upheaval has readily identifiable causes. Frustrating because it stands in the way of credible, pragmatic solutions that do exist. Dangerous because the current populist upheaval is actually benign and constructive compared with what will follow if it is not addressed. Your view on the former PM's comments. Well, I have a certain uh, sympathy with uh, especially the, the last of those points, you know, that I do think that because a lot of the populism is driven by real problems like growing inequality, you know, job loss, uh, outsourcing of, you know, of, of, of jobs uh, and the like, uh, and, you know, this fear of, of uh, too rapid cultural change, I do think that unless you begin to chip away at some of those underlying drivers, you're not going to reduce the degree of anger. And I think you could take the wind out of the sails of, of populace if you made some accommodation. The problem is going too far in that because you don't want to accommodate racism and outright xenophobia. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, you know, the real populist right is, is sometimes toying with and sometimes you know, wholeheartedly uh, uh, pushing for. So it really depends on where you draw the line uh, you know, between policies that are, are legitimate and, and, and will help to diffuse that anger and ones that will simply uh, legitimize it. In which case, let's finish up on this. Uh, all of his faults notwithstanding, would you say that your current president is at least making some progress in dealing with the issues that have resulted in the populist uprising that gave force to his election? <laughs> I don't think he's you know, he's gotten at any of those. I mean, if you look at his economic policies, they're basically classic Republican policies that favor the rich. Uh, you know, deregulation, this tax, uh, so-called tax reform that basically redistributes income upwards. Uh, the trade policies, you know, are, are complicated uh, because a lot of working class voters actually want this kind of protectionism. But I think in the end, uh, everybody's going to be hurt by that. So I don't think he's doing anything to actually fix those underlying problems. And in the meantime, on this important symbolic identity level, he's doing everything he can to make the problems worse and to weaken the fundamental check and balance institutions uh, that a democracy really depends on. We are happy to remind people that your latest offering on uh, what ails us these days is called Identity, the demand for dignity and the politics of resentment. Francis Fukuyama, we are always delighted to have you join us on TVO. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me.
The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.